You know, kinematics is not physics, but it's the language of physics. It gives us some common way of organizing our ideas. It's what is happening. It is, in the most simplest terms, observable. I can see this happening. And then we talk about force something we can't necessarily see happening. We talk about free body diagrams and whether there's an acceleration or whether there isn't. We talk about how these forces might interact. But ultimately, it came down to you're figuring out how much force something is receiving or figuring out how the object changed. And now, of course, we're going to start a, a topic on energy. What's missing here is that if we teach this as episodes, then, yeah, you'll get the force questions right if you paid attention to that episode. And you're going to get the energy questions right if you paid attention to that episode. And most of you will always get the kinematics questions right because they've been drilled into you for so long. There are some schools where they did that for eight weeks. Nothing but kinematics. Now, what's wrong is this is not what's happening. This is not the way physics is intended to work. And it's not a reasonable explanation for how the universe operates. The universe isn't episodic. Each one of these things has a critical role to play in our understanding of the universe, and you can't take them separate. They are connected. The problem is that you guys have had 12 years of education talking about science and math and English and social studies, maybe a little music and art thrown in there for fun, foreign languages, health, whatever. Your science education has been decidedly mixed. The word energy has been a part of it since usually the second grade. You use the word energy all the time. I don't feel like I have much energy today. I need more energy. We have an energy crisis. Where's the energy coming from? We use the word all the time. But defining energy is difficult. Coming up with a concrete way of explaining energy is hard. And chemistry, biology, they have not made it easier. And although you've most likely passed all those classes, some of you even in the advanced versions, if I start asking you what energy is, I bet we start getting some conflicting ideas out there. You'll probably be able to tell me things about thermal energy and chemical energy. And you'll probably be able to trace the energy cycle in the in respiration of the cell or in the respiration of a mammal. You might have an idea about what chemical bonds are. And Energy is tough, though. More importantly, this connection... Like there's some division here is what really makes this hard. Now, I don't start this idea about energy haphazard or slow, and I'm not intending to talk very slowly and deliberately to, for my own benefit. We're about to talk about energy, which ultimately should have been where we started. It is difficult to form a theory of energy that is useful in problem solving without first understanding why energy is important. Energy is also observable. Unlike force, you can see whether something has energy. We have types of energy that are easy to identify and types of energy that are difficult. I'm gonna assume that from your vast knowledge of physics and your vast knowledge of science, you know things like what thermal energy is or chemical energy 
perhaps nuclear energy. Do you have any others? Any others? I'm done with Tyler. Yep. I'm going to group them all together as potential energies. Yep. Mechanical. Okay. That one's harder, but I'll still go with it down this list and looking for other forms of energy, but I'm trying to get you to focus a little bit. What indicator lets you know that something has thermal energy? If I were to measure it, how would I measure it? Yes, sir? Mm, nope. But thank you. I like it when people try. Yep. Nope. It's simple. If I want to know how much thermal energy something has, what would I measure? Yep. Temperature. temperature. Yep. I measure its temperature. <laughs> now, that one's simple, but chemical energy. How would you measure how much chemical energy something has? Think peanut. Because I know what you guys did with the peanut. It's the one lab everybody remembers from chemistry. What'd you do with the peanut? Burn it. You burnt the peanut. That's right. Now, I'm using the peanut. How many of you did the peanut lab? We burnt the peanut. Probably had to sign a waiver because, you know, you don't want that one kid to have a horrible breakout and need his EpiPen because there's a peanut in a room. Can't do anything anymore. And probably just had to watch the peanut thing on TV. <laughs> and if you're that one kid, yeah, I'm making fun of you. I'm going to have some peanut butter later, too, right here in the room. I'm going to smear it on all the desks. <laughs> yeah, I get it. It's horrible. I should, I should probably be burned at the stake for saying it, but I love peanut butter. This guy, how many of you like peanut butter? Oh, yeah. 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 Amen. There it is. I am the first person to be very infuriated when the last Reese's is eaten, not by me. That, that frustrates me a great deal in my home. So... Chemical energy, it's a little harder. Now, there's other ways to figure out how much chemical, their energy, chemical energy there is, but as you realize it, taking something's temperature generally doesn't destroy the object. Burning it probably will. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. So understanding how much chemical energy something has by burning it, that kind of sucks. Huh. <laughs> Hard to measure that too, huh? Because the only way <laughs> is to react it. Which makes it harder. Some of these are pretty tough. Now, mechanical energy, that's a broad term that encompasses any form of energy that is basically based on motion or kinematic variables. That's what mechanical energy suggests. Thus, we are studying mechanics this year. So any form of energy we would talk about is going to be mechanical energy. While potential energy is a different broad topic. Now, here's what I want you to understand. And this part is challenging. Energy is something an object has. An object can have energy. Now we have to be careful here because ultimately energy could be broken down into two categories. One that requires interaction and one that doesn't. Two categories. One that requires interaction and one that doesn't. There's a reason why only two of these can be so easily measured. And that's because they're both based on the same thing. Kinetic energy and thermal energy 
are the same measurement. Thus, they can both be easily measured. They are the most basic form of energy that exists in nature. It is something holistically about a single object. And they are both based on motion. Every other form of energy requires the interaction between two or more objects. Thus, it's far more difficult to measure how much energy there is without in some way disturbing the object. Chemical energy is the interaction of electrons and protons. It's what it is. Find out how much energy is there, you've probably got to mess with those electrons and protons. Break those bonds. Find out how much energy is released. In a similar way, every form of potential energy that exists in nature is the interaction between an object and something else. It only exists due to that interaction, which is why energy can't be discussed without talking about force. Force is the connection between all objects that allows them to interact. So when I talked about the four fundamental forces at the beginning of that unit and indicated that those interactions represent the way in which all energy is made in the universe, I wasn't trying to be in any way small-minded there or trying to say some grandiose thing without really being able to back it up. The connection between objects is force. The transfer of energy has to be through that conduit meaning all energy in the universe gets transferred through force. So if we wish to change something's energy, a force will be required. That's why we can't just, this, we can't just close the chapter and talk about energy. In fact, we will define work as the method Work is the method by which an object's energy is changed. Now, you know, first-year physics students learn about work. When they learn about work, they all tend to learn the same thing. They learn that if you wish to do work, you've got to push on an object in order to cause it to change position. This is what we teach kids in AP Physics 1. This is what Honors Physics will teach kids, that work is force times distance. This is not true, but at least it gets you a starting point. It allows us to get an understanding that work is done when a force changes an object's position. It's a good starting point, but it really isn't the definition. But since that's where most of you started last year, it's not a bad idea for us to start here. The simple definition of work is that a force is required to change an object's location. So I wouldn't say force times distance. I would be better to say force times displacement. But it's also important to understand that it's only the part of the force that's in the direction of motion that actually contributes to the work that's being done. Which is why often there's a cosine associated with this too. To indicate that I need to be aware that only forces that are in the direction of motion do work. And then we recognize that work has the unit of energy. Newton times meter. That is the unit of energy. It is a sense, a joule. And likely, if you had any 
conversation about this at all. You were told that joules and calories were the same. That joule is just a little bit more fundamental. There are 4.19 joules for every one little c calorie. And I would hope that the person who told you this, some of you, it was me, spent a little bit of time trying to get from you guys what a calorie was. I always try to see if you guys remember what a calorie is in AP Physics 1. Of course, we measure heat. We use the calorie for heat measurements. Temperature changes. And we tend to use the joule for mechanical changes. But they are together. You guys also should know that food calories are kilocalories. So one kilocal is one big C calorie. That was also supposed to be in regular basic old chemistry. This also suggests to you how things like treadmills and workout equipment is able to figure out how many calories you're burning. Because you do something mechanical and it does the internal conversion to produce for you the number of calories you burned. It really wasn't burned. It was how much work you did to the machine. How much force you applied over what displacement and it converted it into a unit of measure that's equivalent to the food calories that you see. That's all the machine does. So if you're going to the gym tonight and you're upset that the numbers don't advance as fast as you'd like because you're trying to get to a certain number of calories burned. That's all it's doing. Who knows what... So, moving right along. We're going to need to develop a slightly more um, robust definition of work. And although I don't want to veer that far away from my original description... Work is the method by which an object's energy is changed. That is a great definition. But it's not going to be enough for you to have a full understanding here. Work is the way that force can be measured to change an object's energy. It's a calculation. It is analytical. When we're calculating work, we are attempting to see how an object's energy has changed. Now, I'm saying this because, please be aware, you don't have to do force times distance to calculate work. If an object's energy has changed, work has been done. So you can measure an ob how much work was done by measuring the before and after amount of energy. You've got to stop recognizing that Work, if they ask for it, isn't force times distance. It's a holistic idea about an object receiving something from the environment that has changed its energy in some way. So any measurable change in the object's energy can be conceived as work having been done. You may not know what did the work, but if the object had a change in energy, then you know that work had to have been done. There are some clear easy signs that work was done. Anytime an object's velocity changes, work had to be done. Which suggests that anytime there's an unbalanced force, work is likely being done. But an object changing location doesn't mean work's being done. Remember, it does not take a force for an object to maintain its velocity. So if you have an object just moving in space, work isn't necessarily being done, even though it's constantly changing location. On the other hand, if an object requires a force to change its position, then work has to be done, even if the object's energy isn't changing. These statements, if you're not paying close attention, are all in conflict. Do you understand that? That calculating work done isn't as clear-cut as it, as it seems. Think of this. If you've ever pushed a chair across the room, 
When you were done, was the chair still moving? I am sure that it has now stopped. So if you push something across the room, and when you stop pushing on it, it immediately stops. Did you do any work? Was a force required to move the object? Yes. Under that force, did the object change position? Yes. Technically, work was done. Did you change the energy of that object? It's a harder question, isn't it? Is the object moving? Was it moving before? The, the box was here, and now the box is here. So this is at time zero, and this is at time 10 minutes. It took 10 minutes for the box to go from here to there. When you're done, is the object's energy any different? I do not see a change in energy in the object. But a force was clearly required to move the object from point A to point B. So work was done. But that doesn't mean that that was the only work done on the object. And herein lies the subtlety. A single force can do work. A single force can do work. But that doesn't mean that that force can change the energy of the object. It takes an unbalanced force to change the object's kinetic energy. That is always true. And you'll never go wrong there. It takes an unbalanced force to change an object's kinetic energy. But an individual force can still do work and not necessarily change the object's energy. Think about it this way. If you're here and you push on the box, that means you are applying a force in this direction. The box begins sliding across the floor. I bet you can start naming for me other forces that are acting on the box. Name one. All right, so there's likely friction acting on the box. What else? Normal force is likely acting on the box. Name another one. Let's go with gravity. That's probably more likely acting on the box. All of these forces are acting on the box. Yeah, I could put drag there too, but let's not make it too complicated. Now, the normal force is clearly not doing any work on the box. Why? There's no part of the normal force that's in the direction of motion. The weight is not doing any work on the box. There's no part of the weight that is in the direction of motion. My definition of work still has to apply that the only way work is done is if there is a force in the direction of motion. And whatever part of that force that's in the direction of motion, that one can do work. But normal weight, they're not in the direction of motion, so they don't do work. The applied force does. The applied force most certainly does work. In fact, the applied force and the displacement are both in the same direction, suggesting that the applied force can do positive work. You see, work is a scalar quantity, but it can be positive or negative. The frictional force is doing work here. But if we look at a relationship between the displacement and the frictional force, I think all of you will realize they're in opposite directions. The box is sliding to the right, friction is to the left. The cosine of 180 degrees will make the work negative. Since friction always opposes motion, it can probably be said that friction will always be taking energy away from a system. Here is the important detail. Individual forces can do work. They can do positive work and negative work. Forces that contribute to the motion of the object do work. Now, it is important that you understand that even in systems where the net force is zero, 
work can still be done. However, the kinetic energy can't be changed. So if the net force is zero, the object will have no change in kinetic energy. Now, I'm using my words very carefully here. I didn't say the energy couldn't be changed. I said that under the case of a net force is zero, the kinetic energy couldn't be changed. There are plenty of cases where work can be done that will change the object's energy even when the net force is zero. And you should remember from last year, anytime you lift the box into the air, into the air you are changing its gravitational potential energy. So its energy can be changed when the net force is zero, but its kinetic energy can't. This starts to make work feel like there's tons of exceptions to the rules, but there aren't any. Remember, work is merely the method by which you change something's energy. So if you're trying to change something's energy, you're going to have to do work. How you do that work determines how the object's energy can be changed. You need to be paying attention to it, about what's changing about the object. What are you attempting to do? But ultimately, before you even leave, you have to write this down. We are going to, we are going to decide as a class that when we calculate work, it's from the standpoint of the object. This is important, or I wouldn't make you sit here for this. Positive work increases the object's energy. Negative work decreases the object's energy. So when we talk about the flow of energy, it's with respect to the object, not the agent. For the box to gain energy, the agent had to lose energy. So when we are observing what's happening, we focus positive and negative from the standpoint of what happens to the object. We observe it and its changes not any of the agents. All right, be gone.